Hey all here at OS Reviews. Today we're taking a quick look at a very interesting mini PC called the Dot One by AppCynic. And this is actually the world's first commercially available ARM-based mini PC that's actually using a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor. It's the 7C, a rarity since pretty much the 99.9% .9 run on x86 chipsets from Intel and AMD. So ARM chipsets are much more common on phones, for instance, mobile devices, whether it's iOS or Android. And you may be hearing the news that with a lot of those newer Apple M1 powered MacBooks, they're making the switch into ARM. And ARM-based chipsets, of course, do have advantages. For one, they can be more energy efficient. In fact, I would say that's probably the biggest selling point of something like this. It draws just 5.2 watts of power, which is barely anything. And that means it's able to, again, just use up less electricity. You can use a power bank and can just run for hours and hours longer than a Intel counterpart. So in terms of this particular model, it comes in three configuration tiers. The base model is only priced at 220 bucks, so pretty low cost by mini PC standards, although it comes with only four gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of storage. You can upgrade to a version with six gigs and 128 SSD, which is the model that we have, or also a eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gig variant, which is the top model that sells for around 280 bucks. It is worth noting that only that model comes with a embedded 4G chip. So you can pop in a SIM card and be always connected to mobile data. So aside from being completely fanless, passively cool, just like a smartphone, um, overall it does pack in specs including built-in AC Wi-Fi, so Wi-Fi 5, but not 6.0. The 7C out of the ARM chips from Qualcomm is still relatively entry level, so you shouldn't expect this to be, again, as good as something like an 8 Gen 1, but it's still welcoming to see another competitor in this space. In the box, aside from the mini PC itself, we also have access to just a quick user guide, and underneath this flap, you'll find a included full-sized HDMI cable. There's just the power supply, which is very compact and actually supplies more than what the unit actually draws, though it does use a barrel plug connection, which I hope in the future they can change to USB Type-C, would be universal. There's also just mounting brackets if you want to attach it onto the rear of a TV or monitor. So taking a closer look at the design, the casing isn't anything too unique. In fact, from afar, you really can't tell that this is a ARM-based mini PC, but it is very well built because it has this aluminum alloy shell. It's all metal and has a very substantial heft to it. It looks a little bit generic, but uh, still very slim and thin profile. We have access to two USB 2.0 ports, a third USB 3.0, microphone and audio outputs here at the front. There's also a power key which glows blue when it's turned on, which does look pretty cool in the dark. On the edge here, you'll find the micro SD slot for expanding the memory, although on the 4G variant, you'll also find Find another slot here for the SIM card, which is missing on this particular configuration. On the back here, you do have two HDMI outputs, but this is also a little bit peculiar because of, again, ARM support and drivers just working differently from x86 at the moment. The first HDMI port can output up to full HD 1080p, but without audio. So if you want sound, you have to use the headphone jack there. Alternatively, you can use that second HDMI port, which does support audio as well when being output. And it also is a higher resolution 440p. Technically doesn't have 4K output at the moment. There's also a LAN ethernet port and just the power supply along with the antenna, which by the way, you can also remove if you uh, don't necessarily need it, if you're using ethernet or you're close by to the router. So it is one that you can swap in and out. Again, there's nothing else really going on in the back, although maybe one thing I would like to see them add could be some soft touch rubber feet of some kind that will prevent it from sliding around, but this is a very slim and well-built casing. Uh, you don't really need to open it though, because like I said, all the parts are soldered. You can't, again, upgrade with RAM slots or another SSD. Now doing a quick size comparison, another fanless mini PC that we reviewed recently being the Mealy Quieter 3Q. And you can tell that I would say overall size and form factor of these two are are pretty similar, they're just actively cooled, but of course the Mealy uses a much more conventional Intel Celeron x86 chip. So as alluded to, we are greeted to a very clean version of Windows 11 without really any bloatware to speak of. Although I will say that interestingly some of the icons as well as the text maybe font size just seems a little bit larger by default. Now we can see here 
in terms of the general performance, it's all right. It's similar to other budget mini PCs in this price range, and that means Typically navigation feels fine, but you'll find some occasional moments of hesitation. It's not going to be quite lightning fast compared to some of the more expensive mini PCs, which are rocking, let's say, Intel's Core i-series processors or even some of the Ryzen series from AMD. But with that being said, it's certainly not bad. After all, it's only using 5 watts of power, which is barely anything. With this, there's no ever kind of overheating or thermal throttling. Everything is just cold, in fact, to the touch, which is really not the same that I can say about other fanless silent mini PCs uh, that are running on x86 Intel chips that will consistently get very hot uh, after using it for a little bit of time. You'll often see those need to be using special materials to help with the cooling. For this particular configuration, again with 6 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of SSD, we technically get around 85.5 gigs which are free out of the box. Of course you can further supplement storage using cloud as well as using a micro SD card. With the 7C clocked up to 2.4 gigahertz, although in testing I have seen more typically it runs at around 1.8 gigahertz or so, and sometimes turbos up to, again, 2.2 gigahertz, but it's pretty hard for it to max out, running on the full 64-bit version of Windows 11. So before we take a closer look at how it fares watching back some videos and browsing the web, we'll talk briefly about the benchmarks, which is always synthetic at the end of the day. It's not really reflective of real-world usage, but the Snapdragon 7C, again, it has a pass mark score of typically around 2,800, which I would say is fair. It's pretty much spot on with other mini PCs running on x86 architecture, Intel chips, and the Celeron series. For example, other common choices may include the N3450 from a little while back, or more recently chips like the N4100 as well as the Celeron J4125. You can see are all hitting scores which are pretty close to uh, what we would expect in this price range with this Snapdragon 7C. So the raw horsepower is competitive, I would say, for what it is. Uh, but again, it is a octa-core chip versus on Intel's x86 chips being more commonly quad-core. So you might argue that parallel processing is an area where technically these Qualcomm chips should have a little bit more of that advantage just by having more cores to handle those executions, but um, that's still maybe not necessarily the case since uh, with ARM on Windows being still very much developing, it's definitely getting significantly better and it's impressive that it's able to run pretty well on something like this, essentially a smartphone chip running on a full version of Windows 11. But just keep in mind, again, in the background, what it's doing is essentially translating all of the code uh, from x86 to ARM. So that is essentially the same as doing emulation. So it's not going to be quite as good as what native support can do because of that added emulation layer. It's very similar to what we find in fact on Chromebooks if you are running Android apps. But at the end of the day it still is compatibility which uh, on ARM machines can be still a little limited. For instance on all of the standard Microsoft apps whether it's going to be Office Suite or 365, of course any web browser that is modern and using Google Apps, these are areas where you won't find Find any difference or issues with using something like this. Even looking back at regular Windows software, if you're installing 30-bit versions of older software and drivers, typically that will be fine. But you will definitely still find areas where there might be newer drivers that will just not be supported. Of course, this is getting better day by day, especially with Microsoft trying to support more ARM-based products, uh, and there's a lot of advantages here, as we've seen with those M1 and M2 MacBooks, but it is one area where you have to be a little patient because they may not be 100% there yet, day one. Of course, this is already far better than even a few years back, if you guys remember, with the original Microsoft Surface running on a Tegra chip, uh, ARM-based chips, and using something like Windows RT, uh, which was super limited and you weren't even able to emulate any regular Windows apps or drivers. What that means is if you are more of a light user, primarily with doing things like web browsing, with Office document editing with some Photoshop editing, those are areas where you won't have an issue with using this already. In fact, you'll never even feel the difference. You can stream back videos on YouTube or Netflix, and that's, again, areas where it will shine, along with even cloud streaming for gaming. No issues there. But if you are trying to do a lot of, 
uh, let's say, work with more third-party programs and apps, which are a little more obscure, that's where you have to be careful. Take a closer look now at how it works in terms of, again, some of those other regular day-to-day -day tasks. So web browsing, not really an issue on here. And for the most part, things are still held in the system's RAM when you are navigating back and forth. Maybe some small moments of hesitation, but definitely not bad. Now, in terms of Wi-Fi reception, it's also been pretty good, especially thanks to that external antenna, which you can plug into the box and just get you a little bit further coverage. I was consistently getting three, if not full bars of Wi-Fi, even when I'm a little further away using AC. We try playing back some videos, for instance, uh, we can jump into YouTube here and see how that fares. You'll definitely notice a few drop frames towards the beginning as it is still buffering, but once it reaches the end, things are generally quite smooth and responsive. You really can't tell when watching back the video. So things like YouTube streaming, Netflix, this will be perfectly able to handle. Jump into the full screen view and we're still scrolling around. Things still feel generally responsive enough. Again, it's not really a top of the line chipset, even by ARM standards, there's going to be more powerful options, but those will sell for more. When you are installing some third party apps, perhaps your best bet would also to check out the Microsoft Store. Almost all of these apps are optimized to run even on ARM architecture these days. So things that you can find on here, including games and more mobile like titles, uh, such as Minecraft, these will all work perfectly fine. So things like Excel and PowerPoint, Word, all can open up without any real issues. When it comes to doing things like video editing, that's also where it gets a little more risky, primarily because of A, you have a layer of emulation, and B, the fact that the Adreno 615 that is built into this chip, it's usually also found on some entry-level and mid-tier Android smartphones, so you're not going to get things which are extremely powerful here. You can of course still t stitch together some clips, but because the GPU just isn't super powerful, expect to wait a little longer for those clips to render. In this regard, I would say it's not too different from some of those budget mini PCs which have integrated Intel graphics. Uh, you're getting a similar caliber of performance. Older titles like Half-Life 2, you can play, but it will often be at around 20 frames per second, so you're not going to get even the smoothest FPS there. You can try, again, cloud streaming services, whether that's Microsoft's xCloud or Google Stadia. That's basically just using the browser, and since this thing has pretty decent Wi-Fi reception or, again, even has 4G LTE, if you choose that particular model, it's going to be always connected, and you're able to then play things back on more powerful hardware. So that's more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Dot One Mini PC. Overall, I have to say I am still pretty impressed, considering that this is a, again, ARM-based processor that is running this entire show and, for the most part, doing a fairly good job. It's going to be very impressive to see how these machines will just get even smaller as well as uh, more optimized and things will be more performant. Uh, right now though with this dot one I would say it's a decent choice as a budget mini PC. There's also going to be more and more development and things can only improve in the future. Anyways you can check out more details if interested in the links down below definitely a different mini PC that's been the dot one.